Case 623 by Danny Yu. Chapter 32. He is in a bar. No, a club. Loud, pounding music that reverberates through his metal arm. It is dark with flashes of colored lights. Sometimes they become strobe lights. He doesn't like that. It makes it difficult to see. But that is the mission. There is a man surrounded by women. You would have known the man is powerful even without the simpering looks from his surroundings. He knows how powerful men hold themselves. He's had more than one powerful target. He walks over. So, Tony said, glancing at Steve. You're not going to be an asshole about me sending this one out. Of course not, Steve said. Tomorrow's Jamie's first day of school. You want to be there. He wants you to be there. Of course you should be there. He shrugged. Besides, according to Fury, it's a fairly minor base. Now that Thor's back, we can make do with Nat and Clint, and you and Banner stay here and look after the home base. Then he cocked an eyebrow. Still, Tony. Private school? Tony sighed. You know, he said, in a perfect world, I'd send him to public school in a heartbeat. I hate the fact that this means there's a big risk that all the kids he's ever going to know are other one percenters. But the world hasn't exactly proven safe for him so far, and until I actually wake up and find out we're all living in a utopia, I'm going to have to prioritize his safety above my principles. The school he's enrolled in has state-of-the-art campus security, which you donated, Steve interjected. And don't make a big deal out of the fact that I insist on bodyguards. He won't even be the only kid with bodyguards, which you know, less alienation is always good. They are even alright with an iron cradle in the broom closet. Tony sighed. And while that's really not what made the choice for me, it's really the only school in the area where they have teachers and even some other students who are likely going to be able to keep up with him. So yeah, I could stick tightly to my principles or I could keep my son safer and happier. I'm going to take the second option every time. But, Tony flashed at McGuire, don't think for a moment that having known my dad and godmother gives you some kind of authority over how I raised my son. Tony Howard was a shit dad. He actually forgot me in Buenos Aires once. Had to send Jarvis, human Jarvis, down to pick me up from the embassy. Personally, I was surprised no one kidnapped me. And Aunt Peggy, I love the woman, but she was a mad workaholic. She barely had time for her own kids, let alone me. So having known them 70 years ago, that doesn't qualify you for anything. Good birthday. Steve seemed to deflate at that, at least. I'm sorry, he said. Like you said, it's not a perfect world. He still looked like he'd like to object or discuss, but over these past couple of months of working together, they have managed to establish some boundaries. Steve didn't try to lecture Tony about things he knew absolutely nothing about, like engineering, tower aesthetics, business, and child rearing. In turn, Tony didn't ask about whatever mission it was Wilson was on, and which Steve still joined as often as he could, never mind that Tony was ostensibly paying for the whole thing. Well, they didn't ask again after the first few sharp rebuffs. That wasn't to say that Tony wasn't curious, just like it wasn't to say that Steve didn't often seem to be itching to give lectures on stuff he knew nothing about, but it was the only way to keep things working, and right now, that was what's important. Tony had other ways to find out, of course, but in the name of teamwork and trust and cooperation and all that crap, he played along and left it alone. Good luck with the mission, Tony said, reaching out and clasping Steve's shoulder, giving it the quick squeeze. And if things go belly up, go. I promise, Steve said, and good luck with Jamie's first day of school. Tony flashed him a grin before turning his attention to Jamie's bag and making sure it held absolutely everything a little boy might need for his first day of school. Jamie had been silent so far for the duration of their ride. Tony had taken a town car for once, so he could be in the back with the kid if he was needed. But so far, all Jamie was doing was staring silently out of the window, just the faintest bit pale-faced. Tony wanted so badly to be able to reassure him, tell him it would be alright, but that wasn't a promise he could make, and he didn't want to potentially lie to his son, even if some people would doubtless say he was supposed to. Still, it was school! School had never been kind to Tony, so what kind of reassurance was he even supposed to manage? Maggie, along for the ride at Bruce's insistence, let out a soft bark, resting her head on Tony's knee and looking up at him with kind, dark eyes. Tony let out a breath. The dog was right. Despite school having been under hell, he was still here. He turned out mostly all right. Ish. Daddy! Jamie suddenly said, looking up at him with wide, uncertain eyes that, oh no, 
Tony really should have just followed his gut and kept Jamie back home for another year, shouldn't he? Jamie swallowed before squaring his shoulders, a determined look taking over that small face of his that was somehow already in the progress of losing much of its baby fat and turning angular. Where had all the time gone? Daddy! Jamie said again, and then just about the last words Tony had ever expected out of him. Is it true that you've killed people? Tony couldn't help but flinch at that question. For a moment, he could barely breathe. Mickey let out another soft bark. Tony gulped in a mouthful of air and made a mental note to import some of that Indian tea Bruce liked. Another slow breath, and he allowed himself to ponder the question. Why hadn't he prepared for this? He wasn't an idiot. He should have known that now with Jamie starting school, all that stuff in Tony's past was bound to come up sooner rather than later. He guessed he just hadn't expected it to be this soon. Jamie hadn't even been to school yet. Who was even telling him these things? It didn't matter, he realized. It didn't matter who told him. What mattered was how Tony dealt with it right now, not whether he could find someone to be angry at about having to have the conversation in the first place. The cat was out of the bag, so to speak. No putting it back inside. So what was he supposed to say? Obviously, the answer was yes. Tony had killed people. He had drowned Killian with his bare hands. He had burnt and shot and blown up and otherwise killed more members of the Ten Rings than he'd been able to send to jail. Those were the ones that were easy to explain. Then there were the others, the tens of thousands who had been killed by weapons that had come straight out of Tony's brain. Since it's kidnapping, since he'd seen the consequences of his work, Tony's first instinct had always been to blame himself, to equate his stupidity and naivete, his trust in the wrong people, with guilt. But there was also that one line he had spoken in the speech he had given almost exactly five years ago, when he'd first returned from Afghanistan, and Jamie was a tiny bundle of needs and demands and family. I had become part of a system that is comfortable with zero accountability. A system. He had blood on his hands, yes, but not him alone. Not even mostly him, or so his therapist would happily tell him. And had, quite a few times. Tony should have kept a better eye on what his company was doing, what Stain was doing. He should have stopped and considered the implications of war profiteering far sooner, even if everything had been under his perfect control. Even if he had only ever sold weapons to America and American allies, he couldn't say he was always perfectly happy with what the American military got up to overseas. And allies weren't always permanent allies. It had been before his time, sure, but Stark weapons had ended up entirely legally in Taliban hands back when America was using Afghanistan to fight the Soviet Union. Those same weapons had later been used against American soldiers. It was also complicated, and however poor an excuse it was, Tony had done what he'd known. He'd done what he'd always seen everyone around him celebrate Howard for doing. He'd done what he could to keep the board of old men and stain and the military bigwigs happy and silently worked on his own passion projects in the background. And no, it wasn't an excuse that he had been a naive idiot until well into his 30s. It especially wasn't an excuse for someone with his IQ. But the thing was, as bad a taste as it left in his mouth that he had ever made those weapons, that was all he had done. And when someone was murdered, you prosecuted the murderer, not the gun manufacturer. When someone crashed their car into you drunk, you prosecuted the drunk driver, not the guy who had designed the car or the people who distilled the booze, not even the middlemen. Because weapons didn't kill people. People killed people. Guns might make it easier, but people were still to blame. Tony still had to believe that, hadn't found a reason not to. I have killed bad guys, he told Jamie in the end. Plenty of them. People like Aldrich Killian, Hydra agents, people who hurt others. He paused, took a breath. There are going to be people out there who will tell you I've killed innocents. Thousands of them, but I haven't. Weapons I've made have killed people, but I didn't fire those weapons. I didn't even decide who they were going to be fired at. He paused for a moment, thinking, Last week, you told me one of the other kids threw a Lego at your head. Was that Lego's fault or the other kid's fault? Should we sue Lego for you? Amazingly, Jamie let out a giggle that sounded like pure and utter relief. Of course not, he said. That might just be silly. And just like that, Tony felt the weight he hadn't even realized he was still lugging around just fall off his shoulders. It was true, wasn't it? He had never killed all those people. He had a measure of responsibility, yes, and there were certainly still shit to be guilty about. But it was in the same way that someone who walked past a mugging with their face buried so deeply in their phone they didn't see it had a measure of responsibility and certainly reason to be guilty and was maybe kind of despicable for not seeing. 
not the way the mugger should. It would, Tony said, and he couldn't keep up smiling. Really would, wouldn't it? Gaining, Jamie nodded. The car stopped, and then the driver, former S.H.I.E.L.D., so far worth his salary, as were the two former S.H.I.E.L.D. agents who were supposed to assist Happy as Jamie's bodyguards, all three of them in a car following behind them, opened the door and stepped back. Tony got out first, then stood aside and waited as Jamie bounded out, looking around himself excitedly. Tony still fell back grin on his own face. He wasn't sure it was ever going to go away. And suddenly, even the idea of Jamie starting school wasn't so threatening after all. Happy walked over with Jamie's bag and handed it over, and then it was time. It was the moment when Tony was going to have to send off his baby boy and trust that he would be able to hold his own out in the world. And with that, he felt his smile wither a bit, felt scared and nervous and so, so proud because Jamie was already so much smarter than him in so many ways, was so sweet and incredible, and he was more ready for the world than Tony had ever been. Tony bent down, wrapped his arms around Jamie, and allowed himself to hold his baby close for just a moment before stepping back. I love you, he said softly, and you're going to do great. Jamie flashed him a brilliant smile before walking off with his bodyguards at his heels. He stopped a few times to look over his shoulder and wave, and Tony wasn't sure if he stayed to reassure Jamie or to reassure himself, but he did not return to the car until Jamie was out of sight.